Romans chapter 12. We are merely going to read today verses 1 through 3. Romans 12 verses 1 through 3. I'm going to put it on the screen behind me. Amen. Romans chapter 12 verses 1 through 3. The King James text today reads, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Amen. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment. King Jesus, Master of the universe, Creator of all that is, we love you, Lord, and we love your word. We love, God, the writings of your apostles to whom you gave great responsibility and authority in the earth. Master, today, in the name of Jesus, we loose the anointing and the power of God, not only here in the house of God, but across the airwaves and through the internet. We ask God that the anointing, the precious presence of the Holy Ghost would reach beyond this place and touch the heart and hearing of every hearer. Oh God, how we need to hear from heaven at this hour. We need a word from God. And this preacher acknowledges today, Lord, that I need you if I'm to do the job you've called me to do and do it well, I need your help. Master, anoint the messenger, anoint those that hear, that their heart might be ready to receive, that there might not be heart ground, that there might not be uh, fallow ground, that there might not be ground today, Lord, that is filled with rocks and stones and thorns which would hinder the reception of the Word of God, but rather, God, right now, by your Spirit, prepare our hearts to receive from your Word. We ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I've titled my message today, Pass. P-A-S-S, -S, Pass. And beneath the word pass, I have a byline that reads, Between good and perfect. You know, there is ground between good and perfect. Many Christians and pastors, preachers and churches, denominations preach a message of absolutes and earthly per perfection. They falsely claim that God has a strict standard which must be reached if we have any hope of heaven or redemption from this world. But this message is a convoluted and false message. God's grace today has made it possible for our imperfections to no longer serve as a stumbling block or a hindrance to us in our service of the Lord. Amen. God does have a perfect plan and a perfect will for all of His creation. But sadly, that perfect world no longer exists thanks to Adam's disobedience. 
Neither today do perfect people exist. This is why the Apostle Paul tells us, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We are called to strive for God's perfect will, but less than perfect will still earn a passing grade. <laughs> Few schools today require every student to earn an A or 100% on every exam if they are to pass the subject and advance to the next grade. Most schools have a minimum passing grade. In the instance, for instance, of physical education, it is not necessary that every student be able to perform the same physical tasks and equally excel in various sports in order to pass that subject. No, a child who is the star of the local football team and the child who is unable to throw a football 30 yards will both receive a passing grade. Between good, which is not bad, but may not be good enough, and perfect, which is flawless and ideal, is the middle ground of satisfactory or acceptable. Acceptable is good enough, not just good. I hope you heard what I just said. Acceptable is good enough, but it's not just good. Good. See, you can do good and it not be good enough. Am I telling the truth? See, a lot of people think they're going to earn heaven by being good, but what they don't understand is that's not good enough. <laughs> the Word of God says that we make heaven through faith in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, so all the good you do is good. But it's not good enough. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? So good is not good enough. We have to get beyond good as we seek for perfection and we must find that ground of acceptable. Amen. Paul said in our primary text today in verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now listen that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Do you see the steps? said that good, but good is not good enough because then there's acceptable. If good were good enough, then acceptable wouldn't have to follow it. If acceptable were perfect, if you had to be perfect to be acceptable, then perfect would not then follow acceptable. Am I telling the truth today? Amen. So between good and perfect is acceptable. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad to know today that God does not put a burden on us greater than we're able to bear? Amen. He doesn't expect us to be perfect because He knows that perfection in this life is not possible. One of the things that eats my lunch, I have a fellow that I've known for, oh Lord, 30 something years and uh, he's a Church of God minister and he and I were in contact some time back. And he knows about our ministry. He understands what this ministry is about. And we were communicating. I can't remember if I talked to him on the phone or if it was by email. But anyway, at one point he said to me, Well, but you know, my church is pro-family. And I thought for a minute and I said, pro-family? Well, what do you think our church is? You think our church is... 
got an agenda. We're out there trying to destroy families. We're trying to, you know, go out there and ruin families. What an idiotic notion that because our ministry is LGBT affirming, that somehow we're not pro-family. But then I didn't say anything to him by email or phone call, whichever one it was. I didn't say anything at that moment. But I thought about that comment he made, and, I, and it just graded me. Man, I mean to tell you, it ate my lunch. It got on my nerve over and over again. I thought about him saying, well, our church is pro-family. And as I thought about that statement, I thought and I said, you know, you're not pro-family. You're pro an ideal of what family is. And anything that falls short of that ideal, anything that falls short of what you claim to be the perfect family, a heterosexual mother, a heterosexual father, and heterosexual little children, anything that falls short of that, you're not pro. You're one of them that will have a private Christian school, so-called, that will not permit children to attend your school because they have two moms or they have two dads. That's not pro-family. I thought about his statement and I came to the conclusion that our church is far more pro-family than his church will ever be. You know why? Because our church accepts and affirms all families, yeah. whatever they may be comprised of, regardless of whether there's a mom and a dad and 2.5 children, or whether there be two moms or two dads, or whether mommy is black and daddy's white, or whether the parents are divorced and they're being raised by just one parent. Or in many instances you have children who are being raised by grandma and grandpa. Or just grandma. Or by an aunt. Are these not family simply because they don't fit into your definition of a nuclear slash Biblical family, I got news for you, honey. God understands that the world in which we live today is not a perfect world. God understands that. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus went to the cross. That's why faith in Him is what buys us a place on the glory train one day uh, so that we can participate in the rapture. God understands that the world in which we live is less than perfect. That's why the Apostle Paul said, so that we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Some people will come to you and tell you, well, bless God, the perfect will of God according to Jesus was that a man should leave his uh, uh, parents and cleave unto his wife, or a woman should leave her parents and cleave unto her husband. Glory to God. That's what the Bible said. Jesus said that's how it was from the beginning. Uh, yes, he did. From the beginning, God established certain norms but what makes me laugh is these people will use this passage of scripture to speak against LGBT marriage and yet in context this passage is talking about divorce doesn't have a thing in the world to do with anything but divorce in Matthew 19 3 through 9 the word of God declares the Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, speaking of Jesus, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife, or to, to divorce her, for every cause? And he, Jesus, answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. 
What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. When the Lord used that phrase, he was literally saying that when a couple is then married, that no one should be able to divorce them. They, they should not be able to be divorced from one another because they have become one flesh. But they say unto him, why did Moses then command? To give a writing of divorcement and to put her away. He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife except it be for fornication and shall marry another committeth adultery and whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery you know it's so funny because the same people who use this passage to try to prove that LGBT marriage is unacceptable. It's just not even within the realms of acceptable. It certainly is not good it is not the perfect will of God, they'll tell you. And Jesus in this passage is explaining that divorce was never in God's perfect will. It was never in God's perfect plan. And yet, Moses provided a means whereby a man and his wife could divorce. And they asked him, you know, Moses is our greatest leader. He's the giver of the law. Why is it then that Moses gave a commandment that a, a bill of divorcement could be written in order for a man to put his wife? And the Lord said, Mo Jesus said, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. It was not perfect but it was what acceptable from the beginning listen to me carefully now from the beginning God established exceptions and relaxed the rules to accommodate man's inability to always attain the perfect standard established from creation. Did you hear what I just said? From the beginning, God always allowed for exceptions and He would relax the standard to accommodate an imperfect world. He knew, hey, there's only so much these people can do. <laughs> there's, there's a, you know, uh, even though perfect would be this, not everybody can do that. Even though perfect would be up here, not everyone is capable of aspiring to that. Am I telling the truth today? He said, so what I'll do is, I will allow for that middle ground that I call acceptance. Hallelujah. And as people strive for perfection, all that I require of them is that which is acceptable. Oh my goodness. I'm in church today. There are churches by the tens of thousands in America that would preach us into hell this afternoon and tell us that we have no place in the kingdom of God and we have no hope of heaven. That grace cannot touch the life of an LGBT believer. But I'm here to tell them today between good and perfect, there is this ground called acceptable. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you, you can get a passing grade even though you're not the greatest athlete in the school. You can still pass physical education. They don't give a 100% or an 80% or a 70% grade in physical education, but rather they give simply 
a satisfactory. You remember when you were in school and you'd get your uh, report card and it would say satisfactory for physical education and certain, and certain things like art and different programs. You'd get a grade that said simply satisfactory. And there weren't some people in the class who would get a grade that said perfect. And others who would get a grade that said satisfactory, no, no, no. You either passed that or you failed it, am I telling the truth? As long as you were able to get, uh, uh, as long as you were able to put shorts on and put your sneakers on and get out on the field, that the teacher said, hey, he participated or she participated. They tried. They did everything they could, am I telling the truth today? We've got people that want to tell you that God doesn't care about your effort if you're not able to do like I can do, if you're not able to live like I can live, if you're not able to follow the same rules that I follow, then you're not acceptable unto God. I've got news for you today that is not true. The grace of God provides for us a place of acceptance. While ideals may be presented in the Word of God relative to families, marriage, sex, and life in general, relationships, the truth is that not everyone is able to aspire to or attain the perfect score. Some will do well. Some will do good. Others will do acceptably well. In the end, Acceptable is the best we can do, although we strive to excellence by doing good. So where we start at, Paul said, is good and acceptable and perfect. Well, how do we get to acceptable? You can't get to acceptable unless you're at least trying to do good. Am I telling the truth? But what are we pushing for? Are we pushing to simply do good? No, because if all you're aiming for is to do good, it may not be good enough. Am I telling the truth? So then you have to push for excellence. In pursuing excellence, you will certainly reach that middle ground of acceptable. In Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35, the Word of God declares, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness, meaning does right, does the right things, is accepted with him. He didn't say you had to wear a certain kind of he that uh, fears God and wears a certain kind of clothes or wears the hair a certain kind of way or avoids smoking this or avoids dipping that or avoids drinking that. No, he said he that feareth him and worketh righteousness. So they're doing good, am I telling the truth? Is accepted with him. Now listen to this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. Therefore, therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, According to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. You remember how our primary text started out today? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your 
bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You've got to understand, Paul is merely talking about our earthly existence. He's talking about the fact that as long as we're in this body, we are under a completely different set of rules. That's why he said, you know, uh, we would rather be outside of this body because if we're outside of this body, we're present with the Lord. Amen? He said, but in the meantime, as long as we're in this body, he says, wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, whether we're living or dead, whether we're in the body or out of the body, we may be accepted of Him. Hallelujah. Well, how do we achieve acceptance? It's easily. We, it's easy. We strive for perfection. The Word of God said, Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see God. And there are many who preach that if you have not aspired to and attained holiness, that's not what it says. It says, Follow it. Pursue it. Hello now. It says, Pursue perfection. If you're longing for holiness, if you're longing for righteousness, if when you get down on your knees, I was right here at this chair earlier today before church prayed, and when I pray, I ask God, God, help us to live right. Help us to do right. Help us to think right. Help us to make the right choices and the right decisions. Pursuing perfection. That doesn't mean as long as I'm in this body, that'll even be possible. But you know what? As long as that's my end game, God has promised that is my end reward. Hallelujah. At the rapture, I will put off this flesh and I will put on immortality and I will be as perfect as God could ever make anybody. Hallelujah. In Matthew 25, verses 14 through 29, I will not read the story to you today. We read the story that is often referred to as the unprofitable servant. The Lord tells the story of a man who goes away and he leaves some money with three of his servants. And the only instruction he gives them is, I want you to keep this safe. And when I come back, I expect this back. I'm not giving this to you to spend on you. I'm giving this to you to keep on my behalf. Well, of those three servants, each received a different amount. One, one talent. The other three talents. One, five talents. You know the story. And the master goes away. And... He comes back after a while and he calls his servants to him and he says, Well, have you got what I gave you? And the first servant who had been given five talents said, Yes, sir, I sure do. You gave me five, I'm giving you back ten. Because while you were gone, I put the money to the exchangers. I invested it as you would have invested it had you been here. And I was able to double it and here it is. And the Lord said, Hey, well done. That's acceptable. Are you hearing me now? That's acceptable. Then the next man comes. Well, you gave me three. I did as the other man did. I put it to the exchangers. I invested and I knew that that's how you make money. That's what you do. You don't just leave money laying around the house buried somewhere. So I invested it as you would have invested in. And I'm giving you back twice what you gave me. And the Lord said, well done. That's acceptable. He gives him that money then. The third man comes and says, Here's the one talent you gave me. I buried it. I hid it away. You said that all I had to do was give you back what you gave me, and bless God, that's what I'm doing. And the master said, Now wait a minute. Don't you know me? Don't you know how I operate? The other two men understand how I work. I didn't have to tell them Listen to me, children. I didn't have to tell them to invest the money. They knew simply to do it. 
I'm going to tell you something. If you need God to tell you to live right, if you need God to tell you to quit whoring around and getting drunk and getting high and living like a dog, uh, then, honey, there's something wrong with you. Oh, my goodness. Pastor, you're supposed to be an LGBT-affirming pastor. You're not supposed to say them sort of things. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. If you need the pastor to get up in church every Sunday and preach on these things to try to get you to act right and do right, then there's something wrong with you. Right. You should know that He's holy. Hallelujah. He's holy. He does right. He put the kingdom of God and the righteousness of God first. And He's called us to put the kingdom of God and the righteousness of God first. Not our sex life. Not our pleasure life. He said, I'm giving you back what you gave me. And the Lord said, that is not acceptable. Now, don't you think that servant could have said, but Lord, I did good. I did what you asked me to do. Am I telling the truth? Right. I did good. Yeah, you did good, but you didn't do good enough. You see, because somewhere between good and perfect is acceptable. Notice his Lord, the Lord did not give these men these talents and say to them, now when I come back, I'm giving you five, I expect ten in return. That's not what he said. He didn't say to the second man, I'm giving you three, I expect six in return. Am I telling the truth? He didn't say to the third man, I'm giving you one, I expect two in return. No, he did not. No, he did not. But his servants wanted to be the best servants they could be. They wanted to do the best job they could do. They took what their master had given them and they invested it and they did a job that was acceptable to their master. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? The third man, now did he go gamble that money? Did he go drink that money away? No, he did not. So he did good. Sure, he did good. But it was not acceptable. Amen. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? In the story of the parable found in Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16, we read of a man who has a field that needs to be gleaned. The, the crops need to be harvested. And he goes out at the beginning of the day and he hires a number of men and he contracts with them and says, I'll give you a penny at the end of the day if you'll work in my field for me. They said, okie dokie, I'll do it. Now you've got to remember a penny was worth a whole lot more then than it is now. But then a little later in the day he said, you know, they're not ever going to finish that field up by dark. I better hire some more men. So he goes out and he hires some more individuals. And he tells them the same thing. So I'll give you a penny if you'll go out right now and work the field until sundown. Do all you can do. Okay, we'll do it. After a while, he said, well, sundown's getting awful close. So he said, I, I better send a few more men in there. He goes out, he finds some more. He said, listen, I'll give you a penny if you go in there and do the most you can do between now and sundown. So they do. At the end of the day, sundown comes. He calls all the men that he hired through the course of the day, and they stand in front of him, and he begins to give out a penny. And he gives a penny to the men that worked in the field for just an hour or two. Then he gives a penny to the men that worked in the field for four or five hours. And then the men that had been in the field for the last eight or ten hours, they step up. And boy, they're expecting, whoo, if they got a penny for as little work as they did, then well, I imagine he's going to give me two or three. And he gives them a penny as well. Well, they get upset. They don't understand. The Lord says, well, what's your problem? Why are you acting like somehow or another I shortchanged you? They said, well, Lord, these other men, you called them in at various times of the day, and they didn't do near as much work as I did. They didn't accomplish near as much as I accomplished, and yet I'm getting the same pay they get. And the Lord says to them, uh, how much did I contract with you? How much did I promise you 
at the start of the day, I'd pay you at the end of the day if you worked for me. A penny. How much have I paid you? A penny. Okay, so how then have I shortchanged you? If I'd have hired you and never hired anybody to go out there and help you to help finish it up so that at the end of the day the whole job would be done, if I'd have just hired you and let you all work out there eight or ten hours for the day and given you a penny, you'd have not thought a thing in the world about it. The only reason you have a problem is because you're comparing yourself to others who did less, listen to me children, who did less but got the same pay. You see, in between good and perfect is acceptable. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, don't you think that that landowner, don't you think that farmer would have thought that the best bargain he could get was paying somebody a penny to work the entire day? Of course it was. If you want a good deal for the farmer, then the best deal for him was hiring somebody for the whole day that'll work for a penny. When he went a little bit later in the day, he was getting less, but he was paying the same. Am I telling the truth? And the man he went and hired even later in the day, he was getting even less, but it was for the same pay. But it was acceptable to him because that's what he wanted done. I tell the truth. You see, between good and perfect is acceptable. Perfect might have been hiring somebody at the beginning of the day for a penny to work eight or ten hours, but acceptable was hiring somebody two hours before everything was done and letting them do what all they could do. But you'll notice again in this parable that there was not some arbitrary standard set. You'll notice that the man did not say, I'll give you a penny if you pick ten bushels. And then he hired men later in the day. I'll give you a penny if you also pick ten bushels. Do you follow what I'm saying? And then hire somebody later in the day. I'll give you a penny if you also. So it wasn't about how much they were able to do. It was about doing as much as they could. I got news for you today, children. God has not set up a bunch of uh, arbitrary standards that you're supposed to aspire to in order to make heaven. And if you fall short of those standards, uh, there is no hope for you. No, between good and perfect is acceptable. God expects you to do what you're able to do. God expects you, as in the first parable, God expects you to do what you know He would have you to do. He shouldn't have to tell you everything. You know what's right. You know what's wrong. Somebody comes up and gets on your nerve and, and they act the fool and you decide you're just going to brawl with them and you're going to punch their lights out and you're going to make a fool out of yourself. Now you know that's not God's way. You know that's not the way God would have you to behave. That does not shine well on your testimony. That does not show the world a good example of what it is to be a child of God and to live a Christian life. The Word of God tells us in Luke chapter 12 verses 40 through 48, Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Then Peter said unto him, Lord, speaketh thou this parable unto us, or even to all? And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But, and if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, 
and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens and to eat and to drink and to be drunken the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not, and did commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. And this last portion of verse 48 ties all this together and explains the principle Jesus is explaining. He says, For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask the more. So the Lord says, in striving for perfection so that we can reach that middle ground of acceptable, it's all about using what God's given you. It's all about doing what you can do with what you got. Got news for you, if God didn't make you heterosexual, then God don't expect you to be heterosexual. I, I hate to tell you. If that's not your life experience, if that's not who you are, if, that, if that's not what you've been given, then that is not what God expects you to work with. The Word of God tells us in James chapter 4, verse 17, listen, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. You know, we always love to define sin as doing bad. But according to James, sin is also defined as not doing what you know to be good. Did you hear what I said? If you know something is the good thing to do, what did Paul say in our primary text today? Proving what is the what? The good and the acceptable and the perfect will of God. Am I telling the truth? He said, to him that knoweth to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. So when you know the right thing to do, but you purposely make the wrong choice and do the opposite, you have committed sin. As we strive for perfection, it's about trying to rein this old flesh in. And when we're faced with a wrong choice and a right choice, we make the right choice. That's what God is asking us to do. He's asking us to use what we've been given, nothing more, nothing less. He's asking us to do what we can do, nothing more, nothing less. He's asking us to do what we know He would desire of us to do, nothing more, nothing less. That puts us in the grounds that is called acceptable. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9-12, through 12, the Word of God declares, Know ye not? That the unrighteous, the unrighteous, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. There are people who think this passage scares us. <laughs> nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. In other words, I can do anything I want to do, but not everything that I want to do is necessary for me to do. All things are lawful for me, Paul continues, but I will not be brought under the power of any. 
But you know, in this passage, Paul starts out by saying, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he goes down this list of behaviors and actions. He said, this, this is how you define the unrighteous. What separates the unrighteous from the righteous? He said, such were some of you. But you're washed, but you're sanctified, but oh, but then it gets to that third word. He said, but you're justified. Ah. Oh, justified. Do you know how you define justified? Here's the simple way to look at it. Just as if I'd never. In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God, Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you. How? In the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, but you're washed, but you're sanctified, but you're justified. How? In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Acts 2.38, salvation plan, there it is. If you obey the gospel, you believe and obey the gospel, you're washed. You believe and obey the gospel, you're sanctified. You believe and obey the gospel, you're justified. I got news for you, honey. Righteousness, the word of God tells us, is by faith. Our righteousness today is by faith. We don't yet own it. But the Word of God declares, God calls those things which be not as though they were. We are acceptable to God as righteous, even though we are not yet made righteous. In Romans chapter 3, verses 20 through 26, I'm trying to hurry. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall be no, there shall no flesh, listen, be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remissions of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So when Paul said, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, he's talking about unbelievers. He's not talking about, uh, you know, believers who who act a certain way, aren't going to get into heaven. That's not what Paul's saying. Paul is saying, no, the unrighteous. Well, what separates them from me? My faith in God, my faith in the gospel, my faith in Jesus Christ, my faith in His blood. Hallelujah. That's what makes me righteous in His, in his sight. That is what makes me acceptable unto Him. Now, is my conduct going to reflect my faith in better? Because the Lord doesn't expect me to take one talent, bury it, and then when he comes back, give him back exactly what he gave me. Hello now. John, 1 John chapter 3, 1 through 3. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, 
that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Every man that has this hope in him strives toward perfection. For in so doing, we will attain acceptance. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? Because between good and perfect is this little place called acceptance. Romans chapter 14 and verse 4, almost done today. The Apostle Paul writes, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. How can one servant of God, one child of God, sit in judgment of another servant of God, another child of God? They're not serving you, they're serving God. Whether they are acceptable to God or not is God's call to make. Whether the work they do is acceptable unto God is God's decision to make, not yours. He's the one that hired them. Hello now. See, nobody in, in the parable of, of the man that goes out and hires people to work in his field, none of those men were able to go to their master and say, wait a minute, that guy only did two hours work. He didn't deserve a penny. You can't pay him a penny. No, they, could, they had no authority to say anything. Whatever the Lord contracted with that man is what that man was going to get. I got news for you. The Word of God declares, let every man work out his own salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Because we all must stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Don't worry about my walk with God. Don't worry about where I am with God. Worry about where you're at with God. Worry about your walk with God. Because, honey, God, I know that I'm doing all I can with what I've got mm -hmm. so that I can be accepted with Him. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? Hallelujah. Lastly today, Hebrews chapter... 13 verses 20 and 21. I'm going to close with this. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do His will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Make you perfect in every good work. The word perfect, my friends, simply means complete. Perfect is not about, you know, uh, not having any flaws and, and not having any glitches, not having any sin. No, it means complete. So what we're striving as children of God to do is to walk in, listen to me now, the complete will of God. The perfect plan of God for our lives. That's why the Word of God said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, doing right by Him, doing right according to His standard of what is right and wrong. And all these things shall be added unto you. Oh my goodness. Aren't you glad to know today that you can get a passing grade even if you're not the hero of the football team? 
Aren't you glad to know today that God will say pass because of your faith in His gospel and because you put your trust in His gospel and in His word? Aren't you glad to know today that there is a middle ground called acceptance that is located right between good and perfect? Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Praise the name of the Lord.